In January 1992, Alan Davy embarked on a retrospective exhibition called Solo. It featured a hundred works he'd created over a period of 54 years between 1937, his first year at the Edinburgh College of Art, and 1991. As the installation was nearing completion at the McClellan Galleries in Glasgow, Davy was featured on the BBC Radio 3 arts programme, Third Ear. The interviewer was Professor Martin Kemp, then a lecturer at the University of Glasgow, who in 2010 became Emeritus Professor of the History of Art at Oxford. The recording took place on location at the galleries. The resulting programme was broadcast only once on Friday the 17th of January 1992, the day that Solo, the Alan Davy retrospective, opened. The artworks seen here were all featured at the exhibition. I remember in London as a postgraduate student in 1964 haunting a huge show of modern art at the Tate Gallery. It was called 54 to 64, The Art of a Decade, and was a who's who of who was thought to have mattered in international art at that moment. The show was dominated by American artists working with great boldness on a large scale, like Pollock, Motherwell, Rothko. The British artists looked an odd and diverse lot. There were figurative painters, Bacon and Freud, and even Sir William Coldstream. And there were some accomplished abstract painters. But somehow it seemed that only one British painter could stand up to the Americans in scale, colour and sheer intensity of attack. And that was the Scottish artist Alan Davy. Yet he wasn't really like the Americans in his use of magic, symbolic imagery. Now in Davy's 70th year, a major retrospective exhibition at the McClellan Galleries in Glasgow gives us a chance to take a longer view and a chance to see how the remarkable recent works relate to those of the 50s and 60s. Alan Davy, can we begin with your encounter with American art? Um, in Venice in 1948, I think it was. What took you to Venice and what happened? Yes, I was on a travelling scholarship, uh, <clears throat> which I'd got before the war, because instead of taking it up, I had to go into the army for five years. And uh, during the time in the army, there was no opportunity to paint, so, and I took to writing and became decided I was a poet rather than a painter. Uh, came out of the army, I, I, I became a professional jazz musician and, and made jewellery as, as two methods of making a living. Um, I got fed up with the jazz scene, travelling around doing one night stands with big bands and decided that, uh, well, I've got this travelling scholarship, let's go abroad and see what's happening abroad. We've never been out of England. So Billy and I got married and we hitchhiked across Europe. Well, anyway, we eventually made our way right down into Italy and were entranced by Venice, a romantic, wonderful place. We, we, so much more wonderful than we ever expected. And uh, nobody had told us anything about this Biennale. We were walking in, uh, one day in the town and we came to this park and there's an enormous notice banner over the gate saying Venice Biennale, Biennale di Venezia. And I said, what is all this? You know, what's this? So we walked in, and there was the most extraordinary exhibition of art, probably one of the most extraordinary exhibitions of art ever put on. It was the first Biennale after the war, and everything was there. There was a wonderful Picasso show, a Henry Moore show, Bright, uh, Bonner, um, Miro. I mean, you name it, it was all there. And also there was the Peggy Guggenheim collection which, of course, uh, as you know, contained a lot of the Americans who none of us had ever heard of, including Jackson Pollock. Now, what she had was the Jackson Pollock, the early ones, and I was very struck and, and uh, by these paintings. What excited me was the fact that it was a directly, had directly come from uh, surrealism, particularly Masson and Miro, and it had this kind of primitive quality, which related to primitive art, which is what I was very excited about. And uh, that was, uh, that, that clicked for me. The later Pollocks uh, didn't, uh, didn't strike me as being at all interesting. In fact, that later, when I had my first show in New York in 1956, we spent some time with Jackson Pollock and actually got to know him quite intimately not long before he died. And it was interesting that uh, he had himself realised that this throwing paint on a canvas was a completely dead end. I, I wasn't at all impressed by that. And he had felt that, well, one had to move on from there because absolute freedom wasn't really getting anywhere. 
But these reservations about Pollock were not apparent when you were first in Venice with No, it was, the, the, it was the early Pollocks which, which excited me because they were in line with, with my own personal interests which were drifting towards a fascination for um, primitive art. My first visit to America was very disappointing as regards contemporary art. What excited me was the collections of primitive art in the American museums. That's what really made my hair stand on end. Continuing this exploration of your relationship with American art, particularly abstract expressionism, you claim insistently that you're not an expressionist in the literal sense, since you say, and I think I'm quoting you directly here, that art is not a matter of self-expression. Now, if many of people coming to this wonderful show will feel that they are meeting a very personal Alan Davy, somebody who is recognisable as Alan Davy, um, how do you reconcile for the spectator this sense of works which do have this immensely personal verve, personal handwriting, personal sense of colour, and yet you say it's not a matter of self-expression. Well, <clears throat> through very early times I realised from my very early work in things like self-portrait still life, which I was doing in my teens, I'd realised there was something extraordinary happening. Something I was, uh, if, if I was painting a portrait, I would apparently be trying to get the colour right in this bit of the nose, but there was something beyond that. And if a picture was exciting in the end, it wasn't because I'd achieved my aim, it was because something else had, had appeared in the process, which one could only call magical. So that I realised this magic is what all great art has, and it's not it's nothing to do with expression of the self or uh, of the attaining of an artist attaining what he's setting out to do. Uh, the artist has got to get himself into a position where he's simply a medium through which these incredible creative forces, which are basically creative forces of the universe, magical, and he's got to reach a state where he's at one with these forces, which in, of course, primitive societies, this is the norm. I mean, the uh, people are in, uh, particularly Australian Aborigines, for instance, completely in tune with the environment and uh, at one with the universe. And I think any artist has got to get to that state so that he's, in a way, got to overcome uh, any ideas of expressing himself to get to that. So he gets to a state which is universal and which is recognisable by humanity as a whole. A lot of the imageries are archetypal, that is, they're, they're deeply embodied in the human psyche, and one, anybody can recognise these things as having a deep meaning without having to pin the meaning onto any specific thing. Is the spectator of any consequence in this, or is it simply something that you do and if the spectator wants to see it, has an opportunity of seeing it, that's well? You said at one point, and I think when you were talking about your art previously, it must convey something. Does that not imply that there is a spectator in mind, or is the spectator no, no, a purely no, no, the thing is that um, art for me, the painting for me, is, is simply a kind of private religious meditative activity, which is, as I said, getting me into a, a, a mystical state where I'm, I'm conjuring up things which are beyond my comprehension. And anybody looking at these paintings afterwards has to get into the same state. And, and a good painting is the one which succeeds in getting the spectator out of himself and into this universal mystical state, which is basically a religious uh, state. I think art is basically religious. What is religion but uh, the evocation of the inexpressible through signs, symbols, dance movements, rituals, that is what religion is. We all feel this inexpressible something, this marvellous, magical force which surrounds us and makes the universe and makes everything tick, but we cannot pin it down. It's only through ritual, myth or symbol-making, image-making, poetry, music, that one can express this. So the artist doesn't know what the picture's about any more than the spectator. And one has to explain that all one has to do is let oneself go and just let the pictures soak into oneself. And one will discover in the pictures 
things of oneself which one didn't realise were there. This is what art's all about. If we look at individual works, let's concentrate upon some specific examples. The Creation of Man or Marriage Feast, it's a double title, 1957. You're talking about these elements of chance, of intuition, of spontaneity, of it all happening almost in this rather trance-like way. Yet there is structure and there is a vocabulary, isn't there? Could you tell us about the, this repertoire of symbols, yes, which well, were there even in the early works? Yes, yes well, the extraordinary thing is that I mean, if you take a black brush and make a mark with your hand on a big canvas... What, you're, what you have is virtually some kind of sign. It, it possibly takes, uh, that it becomes a loop or, or even a circle or a triangle or, and one finds oneself making squares. <laughs> or, so that there are vague kind of symbolic things happening which, which, is, which one doesn't intend. I mean, this, the, the, the movement of the human arm, the human body, tends to produce... Forms. And one can imagine that very, very early man making marks on a cave wall and then seeing what the, what is, what the mark produces. It produces an incredible illusion of, a, of some kind of sign in a space. And I've seen in very early times there's a recognition that he was something magic. <laughs> you know? And you, you imagine putting a handprint on a wall and walking back and seeing that. Absolutely terrifying. He was an, a part of oneself which was somehow eternal. You set the artist this tremendously elevated role as a priest, a shaman, as someone who translates experience into a special spiritual domain. But isn't this rather a pious hope in our cynical 20th century age? Well, I think the art has always been in the same situation, right from primitive times. But in a materialist age which we're living in, the tendency is for people to lose faith in the artist, the spiritual leader. The artist is no longer a spiritual leader, he's considered some kind of quack, you know. Uh, but there's never been any greater need for, for the spiritual leader than there is today. And I think I'm quite hopeful that one's on the verge of a new spiritual age. <laughs> I don't mean the revival of particular religions, but a new feeling of religion. I think the hopeful thing is, what well, I find, is in um, modern science, uh, the scientist now knows that matter is not uh, measurable once one gets down to the the atom, one finds as the further, further one looks into the atom, the less less predictable it is. The whole thing is completely irrational and one realises that life itself is, is utterly irrational and pure magic. And that, that's it's this irrational magic which art is, is projecting. In stressing this kind of universality of experience, you have placed a good deal of emphasis in your previous talking and writing about the other things you do, music, gliding, underwater swimming and so yes. on. Yes, well, this is the interesting thing. Um, people think that a painter is someone who locks himself in a studio all day and this is his life. But for me, painting is only one of many activities which leads me into the same relationship with the creative universe. Uh, the first thing, of course, which is common to all men is the sexual experience. In, in the, the sexual experience, one is getting absolutely right onto the point of a creative explosion. <laughs> you know, and I think we all, we all experience. And what happens is one's losing one's identity. One is experiencing virtually the, the same as one should be experiencing in, in painting or music or poetry. It's the same losing of the, of the self in, in this magic of, of the creative moment. Gliding, uh, particularly uh, gliding in the Alps, I mean, it's absolutely incredible. Talk about being among the gods. I mean, there it is. Here I'm at, at 16,000 feet, way above among snow-covered peaks, by myself in a, a machine which is uh, has very little technology, it's very basic. I've just got a control stick and I can feel the, the, the air, I can feel the air in my fingers as, as it strikes the wings. The wings apparently come out of my very shoulders and I become a bird swooping around, around the peak. But the other thing, of course, is when you're up there so high, one gets a feeling of 
how inferior man is, how small a creature he is. You look down and you can't even see any trace of a human being. <laughs> you realize that a human being is just simply a speck of dust in the desert. You know, it's a wonderful feeling that really brings everything into perspective. Looking at the paintings, I get a very strong sense in the large paintings, they're not just to be seen from a distance, which is what you always do with big paintings, nor just to be looked at close to for how they're made. But there's a sense in which if you look at them from that arm's length, there is a total immersion, the kind of immersion you aim at in, in all these experiences you've talked about. Are you keen that the spectator should look at the painting and get inside it from this kind of close range? Yes, so on the whole, people tend not to look at the paint. I mean, the paint is something absolutely miraculous. And looking into even a Rembrandt, you see these incredible passages of paint which have a kind of interior spatial quality which is nothing to do with the actual face. Well, in my opinion, the same thing happens. I mean, I'm not consciously aware of these details when I'm working. I'm involved in a terrific... Um, dynamic process and, and especially in the early days I was actually filled with the most intense energy and, and uh, inspiration not inspired by anything but just this energy pushing me to make something and I, I was working mostly on the floor with liquid paint in order to paint as quickly as possible and I wasn't really, I didn't really take time to see the details that were happening I was just vaguely aware in my mind about the big area and uh, not till later, one suddenly realises that one's... Uh, ah, that's incredible detail, especially in uh, where there's uh, layer upon layer of paint coming, coming through. And, and, and on occasion, working on the floor with liquid paint, the paint would quite often get terribly oily and sort of too liquidy to work in. So I'd try and thicken it up by throwing something, something to dry it. And quite often I'd sweep rubbish off the floor and throw it into the picture just to thicken it up and then continue painting so that looking into the details of some of these you'll find things like matchsticks, cigarette ends, you know, all sorts of rubbish which weren't, were not done there for any intentional purpose and that surprises me. I mean today going around my, with my wife I spent a whole hour looking at these details and finding things which I'd never seen before <laughs> which is absolutely amazing. Are you taking a sign to have a meaning outside a context because it could be argued that if you took, say, a cross, that in different uh, contexts it will mean quite different things. I mean, to a Christian it will mean one thing, to a boy who's made a mess of his arithmetic it will mean another. Oh that, yes, uh, the cross is, is something which turns up so automatically. It's a very ancient symbol. Uh, it was taken up by the Christians, but, but it was, or the origins of it were, uh, very, went very far back, a very mystic symbol of all, it could signify all sorts of things, male and female. I mean, in, in ancient mythology of, of the Far East, the male and female thing was very important. I think this is vital. So that one finds oneself making these uh, marks, which uh, obviously are signs. And as my work developed over the years, I became more and more interested in these signs and if you take this I mean one wonders well what do these signs mean take the, the Egyptian ankh for instance this looped cross and there's a loop on the top and a cross below uh, looks very like some kind of sexual symbol a combination male female so, well I did some research into the origin of this and I find that in ancient Egypt it was simply a pictograph meaning sandal straps the loop went round the heel, the side pieces went round the foot, the long piece coming down went between the toes. <laughs> so how, how can I explain that in later times this came to mean life itself, a mystical sign? It's a deeply moving magical sign which has significance beyond explanation. So that I became more and more engrossed in these signs and the signs became more and more specific. And I started to discover the same symbols cropping up in different cultures. And I've become particularly interested in the, the symbols in um, Aboriginal cave painting and, and petroglyphs, that is, engravings on stone. And last 15 years, so we've, we've spent six months of the year in the Caribbean. And uh, I've discovered throughout the Caribbean these amazing rocks which are uh, covered with mystical signs and symbols, uh, petroglyphs mostly done by 
Carib Indians, well, one doesn't really know but, uh, the origins, because some of these are possibly 5,000 years old. Nobody knows anything about the meaning or intended meaning of these, but as soon as I saw these things, my hair stood on end. I mean, God, the, the spiritual intensity in these signs, and one finds the same signs in the north of Scotland in these prehistoric Pictish stones. I mean, it's astonishing that one finds the same things in, in remote cultures which are not at all related. So it struck me that it's a, it's a kind of universal thing. And, and Jung talks about archetypal symbols. And Jung, I think, sort of hits the nail on the head. It, it, it works. This, this is what it's all about, as far as I'm concerned. You said that you saw yourself as a Celtic artist, as a Scottish artist. I think you said at one point all the rest are French. What did you mean by that? It's well, um, I mean, somebody asked me the other day, well, why, why don't you paint in the Scottish tradition? I said, well, this is absolutely not. I'm the only Scottish artist, as far as I know, who works in the real Scottish tradition. That is Celtic or Pictish tradition. The others are all struck me as being particularly influenced by uh, French or, or uh, German Expressionism or European uh, or early 20th century. This is something which uh, people don't seem to realise. They seem to think that I'm outside the Scottish tradition because I'm not painting like that. You talk about the symbols as being archetypal in general, yet if we turn to your more recent work, if we look at, say, the Hopi studies, these Indian studies pictures, we've got pictures with much flatter grounds now, very brilliant colour, but flatter grounds. We've got symbols drawn with rather strong black outlines and very clear, um, looking almost like Paul Clay, in a sense, in which you can see these individual inventions. Then you have, very often, a text incorporated. Um, the text, does that not shift the symbol into a much more literal, specific form? Yes, but in, uh, say, medieval manuscripts, you get these extraordinarily illuminated capital letters with dragons and serpents. It's very closely related to my own work. I mean, I always feel that I'm, I'm basically a Celtic artist in that tradition with all these magical serpents and, 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 and mythical animals. The, 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 I, I'm discovering extraordinary signs in uh, particularly in the work of primitive artists which ring a bell to me what I find very exciting and so such a terrible catalyst I think my god that sign is so dynamic I must I must use these I must make some drawings using these signs and uh, particularly lately this last year last couple of years I discovered a very old book on uh, Hopi Indian design, which was written by uh, someone who was one, one of the first expeditions to Arizona to dig up prehistoric Hopi graves in Arizona. And um, that the illustrations in that book, all in black and white, uh, was of images coming from these prehistoric pots. And it's absolutely tremendously excited by it, by it. it's absolutely knocked me out and I said I must do some studies of these so I did hundreds of drawings using these signs and most of them are based on bird forms they're so abstracted that in some of them there's absolutely practically no trace of a bird except perhaps an odd tail or some odd feathers or a, a very distorted head this fascinated me enormously and led to a whole series of paintings um, perhaps 40 watercolours and, and 25 big oils, many drawings. Uh, the interesting thing, I, I started writing quotations from this book, which were mostly descriptions of what they thought the images represented, you know, and some of the Hopi myths mixed up with it. And one ended up with something which is, in a way, close to you know, the, the the spirit of of medieval manuscripts, where you get script. Script is always so exciting when it's juxtaposed with with uh, visual, the symbolic, coloured imagery. Uh, it makes a wonderful pattern on the page. But apart from the abstract nature, the the, the letters take on a poetic significance. So the element of poetry written poetry becomes part of the painting. Alan Davy, thank you very much. 
Professor Martin Kemp with Alan Davey on BBC Radio 3's Third Ear programme, produced by Judith Bumpus in January 1992. The exhibition closed on the 22nd of March and was staged again in Bristol the following September. We'd like to thank Professor Kemp and BBC Radio for granting permission to use the interview. Sound, music and images are all subject to copyright. This programme was produced and presented by Mick Vilkoich on behalf of the Hartford Arts Hub.